Shall we do it? Yeah, let's do it. Two thousand and eighteen marks the centenary of the Royal Air Force. In a hundred years, it's evolved from primitive planes of wood and string to flying at twice the speed of sound. My name's Ewan McGregor, and this is my brother Colin. And since we were kids, we've been fascinated by the Royal Air Force. I went on to become one of its pilots, and now I train the next generation of the RAF's top guns. We've always had a passion for the role of the RAF in World War II. <laughs> but now, we're going to tell the whole story of the Royal Air Force's first 100 years by actually flying in some of its greatest airplanes and recreating some of its most iconic missions. We'll explore how planes became fighting machines in World War I. Oh, it's right on our tail! Oh, my God! And the classic dogfight from the Battle of Britain between the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt 109. <laughs> we'll meet the people who made the RAF. From the ground crew to the fighter pilots, the few who saved the country in 1940. I had to fight for self-control because their cockpits were full of ghosts. We'll explore how the Royal Air Force waged secret wars. Oh, my God. Can you say it? Yeah. <laughs> and how it became a vehicle for social change. And I said, I am the pilot. <laughs> we'll meet the Cold War flyers prepared to launch nuclear Armageddon. We all knew there'd be nothing to come back to. And finally, I'll dogfight at supersonic speeds in one of the RAF's latest and most advanced jets. It's going to be quite an adventure. This is RAF Lossiemouth in the north of Scotland. It's where Colin was based for much of his 20 years in the RAF. He saw active service in Iraq and is now a civilian instructor here, using simulators to train the RAF's frontline pilots. The RAF has given Ewan the chance to go up in one of their latest supersonic jets, the Typhoon. So first, I want to introduce him to this incredible machine. Built with European partners, it's the RAS frontline combat aircraft. It intercepts planes encroaching UK airspace and is currently in action over Iraq and Syria. Oh my God, look at that. So obviously this is a two-seat, a two-seat version of the Typhoon. It costs a tidy 60 million pounds, flies at almost twice the speed of sound, and uses 200 state-of-the-art onboard computers to make it a fearsome killing machine. Their weapons, their flying weapons, and there's something a bit sobering about that, I suppose. Also, there's black and yellow levers and buttons that you're not meant to touch, and there's, there's that sort of feeling, you know, when they, people talk about standing on the edge of a great height and they feel like they want to jump there is a sort of feeling like that you know you don't don't pull that handle and then you think what if i pull it what if i pull it and that's the button that you don't want to press and they're just quite close together to so just feel a bit serious about it and i feel responsible about it and i feel very lucky to be given the opportunity to do it and i don't want to barf those are my that's a summary of my feelings Before I get my hands on the Typhoon, we're going back to the very beginning, to when the Royal Flying Corps was the newest branch of the army, and there's not a computer in sight. Wow! <laughs> the 
The Great War of 1914 to 1918 was the most destructive conflict the world had ever seen. It claimed 30 million lives and became infamous for industrial slaughter in the trenches. It also marked the birth of flying as a weapon of war. But just six years before the start of the conflict, no one in Britain had experienced powered flight. This is Army Aeroplane Number 1, the first plane ever to fly in Britain. In October 1908, it remained airborne for 400 metres. Few saw the military potential of flying. French General Ferdinand Foch said, Aeroplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. To explore how the Air Force proved him wrong, Colin and I are meeting former RAF pilot Dave Linney of the Great War display team. He's showing us a replica of one of Britain's first war planes. The BE-2 was designed purely for reconnaissance, to help the army see beyond the horizon. It was unarmed and flown from the back seat with an observer in the front. Just don't put your foot through there. No, I'm trying not to put my foot through anything. <laughs> yeah. Stand on the seat, probably. But that's oh, yeah, OK. Sit yourself down. If you jump in the back... Yeah. Right, OK. And then... And Just swing a leg over. Reconnaissance was soon improved by aerial photography. I'll show you a very early camera. Oh, my God. Camera. Look at the size of it, though. It's the Plate first generation off. GoPro, that is. You'd have to take the slides take the, out. Take the plates out, change the plates. It's yeah, so but clumsy. they got good results. Right. And uh, later in the war, the, um, the photographic results were phenomenal. Uh, Most of the major battles were planned using the, the trench pictures that they got with mm. these things. But it is extraordinary to think that it's like a matter of six to eight years since the flying action. started that they were using airplanes in warfare. Yeah, it's crazy, it's isn't it? But it wasn't long before these unarmed sitting ducks were forced to protect themselves. The initial weapon was that. Oh, yeah? Uh, <laughs> now, I mean, trying to shoot another aeroplane with that when you're passing with a... I'd take out a strut a or a wire of, oh, or something. Exactly. The engine. I mean, thoroughly impractical. Yeah. Um, but they tried. But, of course, now, with this, they can... If you just slot that into that there... Yep. Now you've got a, oh, I see, a yeah. pretty good field of fire yeah. and you've got a machine gun. Right. So you're starting to become more effective. Yeah. Flying offered an escape from the horror of the trenches. Watch your head. But pilots soon confronted a new reality. Slaughter in the skies. If you made the first two weeks on a squad and you survived the first two weeks, then you stood a chance of surviving longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but up until then, you know, it could be days, it could be your first mission. Yeah. Uh, it was very, very poor. Yeah. Pilots faced the enemy's lethal firepower, but they also froze in open cockpits and flew without parachutes. There was a big chance of fire in the air. Yeah. And uh, that was probably the biggest, um, the biggest fear for these yeah. guys. And uh, I know you've still got the revolver in there. I have, yeah. Um, surprising number of pilots would carry a revolver in the aeroplane, not to shoot at other, other aircraft, but to finish it if they were going down in flames. Oh, my God. Terrific. It's now time to get a sense of what it was like to fight in those rickety machines. I'll be in the observer's seat in the front of the primitive BE-2. Colin will do his observing from a tiger moth. Our adversaries are German Fokker triplanes. Agile and fast. The Fokker changed aerial warfare forever. Dave will be in an SE-5, the Spitfire of World War I. The one thing these planes had in common was that they were incredibly hard to fly. More pilots died in training than in combat. It's 1916. With each side vying for air supremacy, Fighter races duelled with the enemy above the trenches. This was the dawn of the dogfight. Oh, it's great. It's so good to be 
airborne again. Brilliant. Oh, so beautiful. The view is amazing. Great. Yeah, it's got good visibility everywhere. Except directly ahead, of course. In the BE-2, we've reached its maximum speed of 70 miles an hour, and it's clear to me how vulnerable and unprotected the pilots and observers must have felt. And then, we spot the Fokkers. Here they come. They close in at 110 miles an hour. We've fallen victim to one of the classic tactics of dogfighting, a surprise attack from behind. Oh, my God! I can see them coming in from behind, it's amazing. The Fokker had the new weapon that revolutionized aerial warfare. The synchronized gun. It fired 500 rounds a minute through the propeller without hitting it. All the pilot had to do was get the enemy in the crosshairs and fire. In 1916, German dominance of the air was so great that the BE-2 was withdrawn after 60 were shot down in one month. But the Fokkers didn't rule the skies for long. In 1917, a new British plane, the SE-5, changed the game again. At 140 miles an hour, it was faster, more manoeuvrable, and it also had a synchronized gun. This one is in the colors of British flying ace, Mick Manick. Manick went on to become the archetypal fighter ace, shooting down 61 enemy planes. But he also broke the mold. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Most recruits were rich cavalrymen who could afford to buy a pilot's license. He was working class and Irish with Republican sympathies. His diaries also reveal the strain on this new breed of warrior the fighter pilot. Over the lines today, engine cut out three times, wind up. Now I can understand what a tremendous strain to the nervous system flying is. This one's from the 20th of July, 1970. I had the good fortune to bring a Hun two-seater down in our lines a few days ago. Luckily, my first few shots killed the pilot and wounded the observer, a captain, besides breaking his gun. I hurried out at the first opportunity and I found the observer being tended by the local MO. The journey to the trenches was rather nauseating. Bits of bones and skulls with the hair peeling off and tons of equipment and clothes lying about. This sort of thing, together with the strong graveyard stench and the dead and mangled body of the pilot and NCO, combined to upset me for a few days. I think that's the thing about it is so, it was so close up as well and personal, you know, so... Mm. I mean, he actually saw that he killed the pilot and injured the, yeah. the observer. So you're, you're not detached from it. You're totally eyeball to eyeball, almost as if you're on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. My experiences, I suppose, in modern sort of warfare, certainly in the RAF, you're so detached from what you're doing. Um, and you certainly don't land and go and have a look at you know, no. the results of what you've done. You no. know, so. It combined to upset me for a few days. Mm -hmm. I bet it upset him for a lot longer than yeah, that. Yeah. Like many great war pilots, Manick paid a terrible price. He was suffering from what we now recognize as combat stress and was haunted by nightmares of his aircraft in flames. In July 1918, he went down with his burning plane. Pilots could soar through the skies, but they couldn't escape the horrors of warfare. 
one in four of them did not survive. We walked off the playing fields into the lines. We lived supremely in the moment. Our preoccupation was the next patrol, our horizon, the next leave. We were trained in one subject, to kill. We had one hope, to live. And when it was all over, we had to start again. The Royal Air Force was born in April 1918. By the end of the war, it had grown from just 60 airplanes to 22,000. From the beginning, the RAF was at the forefront of innovations in aviation. But in peacetime, the Army and Navy wanted to kill off the new upstart rival service. One man was to save the infant RAF and shape it into a modern, forward-thinking force. Hugh Trenchard, known as Boom because of his loud voice, founded the Air Academy I attended at Cranwell. It became the RAF equivalent of Sandhurst, the home of Army officer training. But Trenchard also realised the pyramid of technical support needed to get a pilot in the air deserved the best training too. I've come to RAF Halton to explore this legacy. In 1920, Trenchard introduced an apprentice scheme here that encouraged ground crew cadets to rise to the top of the service on merit alone. Ground crew are still trained here today. I'm meeting an old friend, Air Marshal Cliff Spink, who trained me to fly the Spitfire. He was apprenticed here in 1963, aged 16, and benefited from the system set up by Trenchard. Being, a, a, in my case, a farmer's boy, and suddenly being thrust in amongst young lads from all parts of the country, from all sorts of backgrounds, and so, yes, I can remember suddenly this, the enormity of it all and almost saying to myself, my goodness, what have I, what have I done? What have I done? But it happened to be the best thing I ever did. Yeah. Partner! Last bit to sprint, let's go, find your partner! It's something that the Air Force always did, it really brought you in to the fold and sometimes it had to knock you down before it built you up. And uh, we weren't all of the same mould, but they brought you into a corporate entity and teamwork and leadership. They seem like clichés, but they're not. They were real building blocks, and Halton did it really well. Thousands who passed through Halton owe a debt to Trenchard. Cliff himself went on to rise to the top of the RAF. Having a vision for an Air Force in the first place, an independent Air Force, was fundamental, but he saw that the building blocks associated with that, yes, the officers associated with Cranwell, but Trenchard could see the need for that corps, who were so well technically trained, to be able to take the Air Force forward. In the class-ridden society of the 1920s, Halton was unique. Any apprentice who did well enough could then go on to train as a pilot. It was a, a sort of meritocracy, I guess, wasn't it? So, I think that's something that the Air Force has prided itself on, that you come from any walk of life. And um, if you've got the skill and the dedication, um, you can make a success of it at whatever level you want to go to. And I think that meritocracy has been uh, the lifeblood of the Royal Air Force. Trenchard's innovations in the 1920s helped the RAF survive. But just a few years later, they would be tested to the limit when Britain went to war once again with Germany. When the Second World War began, the RAF faced in the German Luftwaffe the largest and most technologically advanced air force the world had ever seen. In 1940, with the British Army routed, 
and the Germans now only 20 miles away across the Channel. Adolf Hitler launched an all-out aerial assault to prepare the way for invasion. Only the RAF stood in his way. When the Battle of Britain started in June, just 640 RAF fighters faced 2,600 German planes. But even though it was outnumbered, this was a battle the RAF had been built to fight. Its revolutionary air defense system used radar to detect incoming enemy planes. It was then down to its new fighter planes, the Hurricane and Spitfire, to scramble and intercept the enemy. On the 13th of August, the Luftwaffe launched its main offensive to smash the RAF on the ground and in the air. As the Germans crossed the coastline, dogfights on a scale never seen before raged above southern England. There are just a handful of pilots alive today who fought in the battle, and I'm privileged to meet the youngest of them all. Geoffrey Wellham was just 18 at the time. I suppose the first time I flew a Spitfire, the thing flew me, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to flow around the sky. It slipped through the air, and the mere thought that you wanted to do something conveyed thought to your hands and feet, and the Spitfire seemed to do it. And it was just a, a wonderful feeling of, this is what I've always wanted to do, this is where I want to be. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. In the summer of 1940, there was little time for playing with the clouds. By the end of August, the RAF was in big trouble. On the 31st, they suffered their worst day. 41 planes were lost. At this low point, Geoffrey found himself thrown into the battle. On his first sortie, he ran into a force of 150 enemy planes. I'd never seen so many aeroplanes. There was a mass coming towards us. And I remember thinking, good God, where do you start in on this lot? I was spraying bullets all over Kent, but we went straight through the middle of them, one passed straight over the top of my head about, well, I don't know, but I, I, I imagined I heard his engines, and I thought, this is, this is dangerous. And I broke away, and, uh, and then you uh, thought, well, now go back and have another go. The deadliest enemy of all was the Messerschmitt 109. It's impossible to know how frightening it must have been to fight for one's life in the skies. But today, I'm going up in a two-seat Spitfire to try and get a sense of what it was like to take on an ME-109. What a feeling taking off with two of the most iconic fighter planes of all time. The 109 had superior firepower, and its battle-hardened pilots used surprise to deadly effect. And in comes Jerry, and he just comes straight slashing past us, firing his guns about there, about 50 to 100 yards. We wouldn't even have known he was there. Already I'm getting a real sense of just how different this is from World War I. The planes are so much faster. The reaction time just has to be so much quicker. Both planes had a maximum speed of 350 miles an hour. But the Spitfire had one great advantage. In a dogfight, it could turn tighter than the Messerschmitt to shake it off, or get on its tail to shoot it down. So we're gaining 
on it. You're not getting away. Flying up to five sorties a day, pilots like Jeffrey had to learn quickly how to outwit this formidable foe. Never, ever fly straight and level for more than 20 seconds in the combat area because it was always the 109, the German that you did not see that shot you down. Because I always felt that, rightly or wrongly, if I could see my antagonist, I always felt that I had the ability to outfly him in a Spitfire. In the air, the Germans were losing two planes to every one of the RAFs. But constant attacks on British airfields had put RAF crews under intense pressure. Well, the worst part was sitting in dispersal, waiting. The phone went, scramble base 12,000. From there on, you ran like mad for your aeroplane, and you were supposed to be airborne in within four minutes. The ground crew had already started the engine. Your parachute was on the wing, waiting for you. You put it on, they helped you into the cockpit. You were too busy and gushing around too much to be all that apprehensive. Did you, did you recognise how fatiguing, how, how tiring it was? Not at the time. Um, you just carried on. You became an automaton. You managed to get into the mess or wherever you were after a heavy day and feel totally exhausted, drained. But then, you know, you had a couple of pints and... Uh, you had to snap out of it. But just when it looked like the RAF might buckle, the Germans switched to bombing cities. It was a tactical blunder that allowed the RAF to rearm. So when the Germans launched a massive attack on September the 15th to finally break the RAF, they suffered some of their heaviest losses. German High Command had failed to gain air supremacy. Attacks continued into October, but invasion was now no longer possible. Jeffrey's squadron suffered some of the highest losses. You were always aware of absent friends, but you put it behind you. You go to the White Hart and have a few pints and think, well, last night, John was here. He's not now. Yeah. And I can see it now, clearly. In the evening, all the boys there in their best blue, smoke rising to the ceiling, pints knocking back. A fighter squadron, survivors trying to relax, and the boys enjoying and very much aware of one other's company. Yeah. It was almost a love affair, really. A, a love affair with one's fellow man. You know. But I think it, it took more out of us than we realised at the time. And because at the end of my second tour, I had a, a bit of a breakdown in health and was uh, invalided home, as it were. Recently, Geoffrey was invited to witness a Spitfire display. Watching those spits getting airborne and forming up into a battle formation, uh, a lump came into my throat and I, I had to fight for self-control because their cockpits were full of ghosts. The Royal Air Force had won the Battle of Britain, the country's first real victory of the war. It supercharged morale and turned the atmosphere of defeat into the potential for ultimate victory. But the cost was high. Of the 3,000 RAF pilots who fought in the battle, 544 lost their lives. The young pilot's heroism was immortalized by Winston Churchill when he stated that never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few.
Without the help of one little known organization, the battle might never have been won. Pilots were in such short supply that the Air Transport Auxiliary was created to deliver combat aircraft to frontline bases. We've tracked down two of the first women pilots to fly in World War II, Mary Ellis and Joy Lofthouse. When filming took place, Mary was 100 years old and Joy, 94. The ATA's air taxi was the de Havilland Rapide. Art Deco, air in the 30s. Everything looked beautiful in the 30s. There's a crossroad again. Ooh. Their organization was made up of a thousand pilots. In a remarkable breakthrough for equality, born of necessity, 166 of them were women. I'm dying to go to the loo. OK. <laughs> Look at you. You'd get in there in a flash, wouldn't you? I bet you not get in. No. <laughs> You'd love it, though, I, if you could. I would not like to get in there, <laughs> even with a pair of steps. Oh. I'd rather <laughs> hang on to my toy boy. <laughs> you said you didn't like toy boys. <laughs> well, he's quite a mature toy boy, let's be honest. Who is it? My favourite toy boy. Oh, um, Martin. Martin. Martin Shaw. Shaw. Oh, no, yeah. yes. He's a very, yeah. very good actor as well. He wasn't yeah. available today, sadly. <laughs> anyway. He wasn't available. He wasn't available today, no. He wasn't Martin available Shaw. today. <laughs> sadly. So you're his stand-in. Yes. I'm the stand-in, yeah. I'm the stand-in. Exactly. Mary and Joy share my passion for flying. It's so wonderful. It's freedom. And you can more or less do what you want. It's yeah. the, next, the, when you're up the there. next best thing to having wings yourself, you know. Yeah. You might just as well have wings. You're up there. Nobody can tell you what to do or where to go. Or... Yeah. Joy had never flown before. Mary was an experienced pilot. She'd learned before the war, when flying was largely the glamorous hobby of wealthy men. I flew 76 different types. And I, I flew a meteor without any instructions at, at all. Throughout the war, the ATA delivered a total of 309,000 planes. Mary alone delivered a 1,000 of them. Summary for July 1945. Argus, Spitfire, Corsair, Barracuda, Sea Otter, Vengeance, Tempest, Firefly, Wildcat, Anson, Wellington, Ventura, and Mitchell. And that's in one month? That's in, yeah, one month. Flying planes straight from the factory that are yet to be fitted with navigation leads made this one of the most dangerous jobs in the war. One in 10 of the ATA pilots were killed. One of their colleagues, Joan Hughes, was just five feet tall. She had to wear wooden platforms to reach the pedals. And what reaction would you get when you landed as, as a female pilot stepping out of a Wellington bomber on your own? I, I uh, opened the door, you know, and put down the steps and got out, and I waited at the bottom because there was a crowd of, of RAF people with a car to take me to the control. And uh, I stood there for some time, and, and then they said, can we go to control, please? And they said, we we're waiting for the pilot. And I said, I am the pilot. <laughs> they wouldn't believe me, and two of them were ordered to go up in the Wellington and search it to find it. They came out and said, no, there's nobody else there. <laughs> The ATA girls were the first women in Britain to gain equal pay. They led the way for female pilots. They became known as the glamour girls of World War II. Oh, well, we were never without an escort. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Some girls used to have um, racing parties Boy, with the with naval officers, yes. I ah. know. <laughs> really? That I sounds know. interesting. 
I was taken to it once and she said, I think it's, you'd better go home now, Joy, uh, whoever took me to the party. She thought I was too young to get a, too involved in a, by the time they started chucking the keys on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I found the courage of these women very inspiring. 75 years on, I'm about to take my first flight in the typhoon, and I'm really nervous. It's so manoeuvrable and it exerts such huge stresses on the body that I have to pass a strict medical to prove that I'm fit to fly. And have you been up before? I was up in a tornado once with my brother. Okay. About some years ago, so okay. that's my only uh, similar experience. Yep. And I was uh, sick. Yeah, you'll definitely be sick then on a typhoon. Oh, do you think? <laughs> yeah. Corporal Iona MacDonald is checking that I can get out of the plane intact if I'm forced to eject. Right, this one here is butt it to knee. So if you just keep your bum right up against the wall again and put your knees together. So if I can just get you to lift up your T-shirt at yep. the front for me. That's Next, a thorough checkup from Wing Commander really Joanne really Collins. Really so just literally just going to have a listen to your, to your heart sounds. And then when you're ready... Because of the rapid pressure changes in the typhoon, my sinuses and ears have to be clear. And relax. Did you feel that pop? Yeah. <laughs> I'm also given help on how to combat the G-forces I'll experience. Breathe in for one second and then... Out, the in. typhoon can exert a force the equivalent of nine times normal gravity. And that in itself will make sure that you get enough blood and oxygen to the, to right. the brain and, and will reduce any chances of you uh, losing consciousness up okay. there. This one here, you'll need to just hand to the pilot that's going to be flying you, just to confirm that we've done the medical and that you're fit to fly. OK. So you let me go? I'm going to let you fly. Great. <laughs> <laughs> In World War II, after the Battle of Britain, thousands of new recruits were undergoing slightly less rigorous medicals. If the few had saved the country in 1940, it was the many who would now take the war to Germany and bomb it into submission. The man behind this campaign was the head of Bomber Command. Arthur Harris was ruthless, relentless, and convinced he was right. He believed that under the weight of high explosive and incendiary bombs, German morale would collapse. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. In 1942, Harris put together the first of the thousand bomber raids. Its target? was the industrial city of Cologne. For the next three years, RAF crews would wage a new and terrible form of warfare. Night after night, raids targeted German cities. The seven-man crews and the new four-engine bombers like the Lancaster faced formidable German defenses. We were caught in searchlight, and they had us for 35 minutes. Now, you, you could guarantee, basically, that if you were caught in searchlights, you could say, good night, nurse. That was your lot. You can view the target on flames and surrounded by millions of shell bursts. It looks like hell. Uh, and you really think that uh, this is going to be it. To cope with the strain, many nurtured a live-for-the-day attitude. It led to an unexpected medical problem that almost derailed the bomber campaign. I'm meeting author Patrick Bishop, who's just uncovered this secret story. I came across this extraordinary file in the National Archives. Uh, in amongst this bundle of papers, someone's written on the, on the margin of, uh, of one document. This is an extraordinary story, and it really is. It's, it's about 
this outbreak of uh, VD in the RAF towards the end of 1942, mm -hmm. and it's particularly marked in Bomber Command. But the Bomber Command instance, I think, is four times higher than it is in the other really? branches of the RAF. Veterans of Bomber Command told us about the warnings they'd received on the dangers of sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> the late squadron leader Tony Iveson relished recounting a dirty ditty. If she's easy, she's got it. <laughs> if, if she's got it, you'll get it. <laughs> and remember, a blob on the knob slows demo. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur Harris offered a typically blunt response to the problem. Normally, Harris was quite indulgent about hijinks and, uh, you know, booze-ups and all the rest of yeah. it. But uh, in this case, he was uh, far from indulgent, and his response is quite chilling. He issues this uh, instruction that anyone who is discovered to have contracted VD uh, will be made to start their whole tour of operations over again, no matter what point they've actually yeah. reached it. Yeah. And as you know, a, a tour is, is 30 ops. So what he's saying is, um, even if you're on your 29th op and you've caught a dose of the clap, you have to you're get back, back to, to square one. Back to square one. At this time, you've got a one in five chance of surviving your tour of 30 ops. So what this amounts to, really, if you're in this situation at the end of your tour and you have to start all over again, it's more or less a sentence of death. Wow, and that's pretty horrendous. The gruelling tours of 30 operations in highly vulnerable bombers meant the campaign produced the highest British casualty rates of the war. Out of a force of 125,000 men, 55,000 never came home. No, I'd never flown before. Hadn't even driven a motor car before. Never, ever, ever was I ever comfortable. No. No. Frightened to death. And anybody that says he wasn't, well, he's a bloody liar. All right. Well, he's right in there, isn't he? He's right quick, isn't he? For us, no one better represented the courage of this band of brothers in the air than tail gunner Dave Fellows. When we met him a few years ago, he even showed us how a gunner got target practice. Clay pigeon shooting. We winged it. You winged it. You definitely winged that last <laughs> one there. He was once asked to bail out of his Lancaster after a mid-air collision. The skipper said to me, well, David, you can uh, bail out if you wish. We could still have been attacked by enemy aircraft. My turret was still operational. So why should I jump out? What, leave my mates? We'd been looking forward to catching up with Dave. But sadly, he passed away a few days before we began filming. The plane Dave flew, and the most potent symbol of the bomber campaign, is the Lancaster. Britain's last flying Lancaster has just undergone a major service. We're being shown round the plane by its present-day guardian, yeah. squadron leader Andrew Milliken. Wow. Wow, wow. Look at that. So this is um, painted up in the colours of 460 Squadron, which was the Royal Australian Air Force uh, Squadron Aeroplane. Oh, okay, all right. And the reason we wanted to paint it up in 460 was um, to commemorate not only what the Australians did, because of course young men from all around the Dominions came to join Bomber Command, yeah. but also it was Dave Fellow Squadron, who sadly passed away just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We loved hanging out with David. He was we? a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, we did. But he, did get, he got a chance to see it before he passed away. Didn't he? he did, yeah. He did see the aeroplane he before did? he passed away, oh, so he nice. saw it in his colours, which oh, is so absolutely wonderful. brilliant. Yeah. Oh, the bomber campaign and the Battle of Britain are defining episodes in the history of the RAF. But one largely unsung effort made perhaps just as great a contribution to the defeat of Hitler.
to uncover how the humble aerial photograph first used in World War I became a formidable secret weapon, I'm meeting Wing Commander Mike Mockford. So, Mike, what are we looking at here? Well, have a look at that, because that is a, a typical three-dimensional image, which was absolutely vital to the gathering of intelligence during the Second World War, and all the way up to today, actually. Oh, my God. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, if you say, oh, my God, I know you can, yeah. because uh, that means... There's two flat images. Yeah, you're seeing... You're merging the images, and you're seeing buildings have height, hills and valleys have uh, height and, and holes, as they say, because you improve your intelligence collection from 3D photography by probably 17 or 20 per cent. The photographs were taken by specially adapted Spitfires like this one. Unarmed and carrying extra fuel, they could conduct seven-hour sorties at heights and speeds that outstripped any enemy plane. They carried two cameras that took photos that were slightly offset from each other. Combining the two made the 3D image. That's what you've got there. And then and where... You're I... looking at Colditz. Oh, is that right? Colditz Castle. The HQ for this top-secret operation was a country house on the Thames, RAF Medmanham. The highly skilled photographic interpreters identified some of the greatest threats to the Allied war effort. And there is an interesting story of a professor at RAF Mebenham who had been working all night, and he came running down the stairs at breakfast time in the morning and said, I've done it, I've done it, I know what it is, and in his underpants. Because <laughs> <laughs> he'd forgotten the dress. Fantastic. And, and they said to him, you better go back and get dressed before you go and tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Such passion, it's great. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, they were... I, I think that's a good word. They were passionate about what they did. Mm. RAF Medmanum's greatest intelligence coup was uncovering the secret V weapons that Hitler hoped would turn the tide of war back in Germany's favour. The most dangerous was the V-1, the Doodlebug, a pilotless drone that started to rain down on London in 1944. The first of the V-1s was spotted in this photograph a tiny cross on a launch ramp. Their launch sites were notoriously difficult to find. Mike is putting me to the test by getting me to find one. This is a Dutch sugar factory on the Dutch coast. You're looking for a ramp. A ramp in a, like a yeah, ski Yeah, a slope thing. ramp, yeah, because they were launched from a ramp. For the photo interpreters, it was like looking for a deadly needle in a haystack. They became masters at spotting the clues that were as small as a millimetre across on the photographic prints. Telltale signs. In the open ground here is ground scarring. Yes. Now, that is where the V-1, when it was launched, carried a booster motor, mm -hmm. which was a small rocket. When it got airborne, the booster motor dropped off, mm -hmm. and that ground scarring is where they fell to the ground. I see. You follow that back, on the roof of that building, is some light tone damage. Oh, yeah. Where odd bits have hit the roof. The ramp is just alongside the building there. See that dark shape Let alongside the building? Have a look. Um, dark shape here? It's, it's a dark line alongside the building, yes, just there. Oh, I see it, yeah. Yeah, see it. And they had 238 sites, I think mm. it was. Had they ever launched 2,000 V1s in every 24 hour period, they would probably have destroyed London. Yeah, yeah. Once the target was identified, the RAF was able to put their bombing skills into action. Day and night, many targets are being hit. In the occupied countries, in the Nazi Reich itself. Throughout the war, more than 30 million photographs were taken. 3D photography provided as much as 80% of British intelligence. The general intelligence gathered by Mebenham was beyond question a huge contribution to, to our victory at the end of the war. Yeah, yeah. The RAF's role had now grown beyond fighters, bombers and secret intelligence gathering. It was also crucial to the clandestine work of the Special Operations Executive, working behind enemy lines. And they had the perfect tool for the job. The Westland Lysander is one of my favourite planes. 
It's slow and unarmed, but an ideal covert air taxi. It could land in a rough field just 150 yards long. It's the 16th of April, 1943. I'm playing the agent Nick Boddington, waiting to be picked up from occupied France. My first job is to lay a flare path. Three torches in a pre-arranged pattern so the Lysander can find our temporary runway in the dark. Up in the Lysander, I'm playing Ewan's replacement. It's given me a sense of just how brave they were. Flights could last seven hours and penetrate 600 miles into the heart of occupied France. I'm in good hands. The pilot that night was Hugh Verity, who flew 30 clandestine missions behind enemy lines. OK. I think I hear him now. The golden rule was just three minutes on the ground, because at any moment this field could be full of Germans, so every second counted. Oh, I can see where they are. Okay. I've got to Morse code a letter that's pre-arranged and the plane sees that Morse code letter and if it's the right Morse code letter, he replies one. Okay. And if those letters are not the right letters, the game's off. He buggers off and we bugger off. There, look, the red light. Yep. Quite a brilliant sight, isn't it? Look at that. Boddington wasn't just any old agent. He was an SOE chief, returning with valuable intelligence about compromised agent networks. He was relieved to be rescued as the Gestapo were on to him. Three hours later, Boddington was safely back in Britain with his invaluable intelligence. The Lysander didn't just ferry hundreds of agents in and out of enemy territory in Europe. It also played a vital role in the war in Southeast Asia. Fred Bailey, now aged 96, was a wireless operator. In 1945, he was dropped behind enemy lines in the Burmese jungle to harass the Japanese army. Fred's job was to call in airstrikes and to get the local tribespeople to revolt against their Japanese oppressors. We had to carry all the food we needed and explosives and ammunition. Um, and, in fact, uh, we got fed up carrying it around in the jungle. We bought an elephant. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And uh, we loaded all the gear onto the elephant. But what, I, what we didn't know was that elephants needed a day's rest after about three days' walk. Well, I'm a bit we like could, that. We, we, yeah. <laughs> we, well, we, we, there was no way we could rest. We had to keep on the move. Yeah. Uh, because the Japs were after us. Yeah. And, in the end, the elephant got fed up and pushed off. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Fred looks friendly enough now, but back in the day he was trained to kill. Is that is that what you were? You were... Yeah, a fighting knife. Yeah. That's from the front of the commando magazine, yes. isn't it? The yeah, it is. comic. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I had one of those. Were yeah. you quite tasty with one of these? Uh, yes, yes. I do. You want a demonstration? Yes. Quite <laughs> yes. Well. Oh God. Not a real one. <laughs> with the Japanese closing in, Fred and his team needed to be rescued fast. So they called in a Lysander. Very relieved to see it. I'll bet, yeah. There were uh, five of us crammed in it with the pilot. Five? Um, we had a Burmese agent with us. Right. And he was a little fella. He sat in the front with the pilot. Right. And we three crammed ourselves in the rear cockpit. Right. I was on the floor 
uh, I didn't see much, but it was quite a quite a tight uh, yeah. tight fix. But I guess you didn't really you didn't really care how. No, no, how no. <laughs> you were no, desperate no, to get we, out. We had right to get out. Yeah. Yeah. And I always think it's an amazing credit to the pilot that in the middle of the jungle, this tiny airstrip, he could find it from just a map reference. But find it he did, and uh, it came down and. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we were airborne again. Wow, right. By the time of the Allied invasion of mainland Europe on D-Day, the RAF at the US Air Force had achieved dominance of the skies of Western Europe. With 1.2 million personnel on the ground and in the air, it was proving a highly effective organization. It was capable of carrying out precision attacks, like the legendary bouncing bomb used in the Dam Busters raid. But the vast majority of bomber crews were still relentlessly attacking German cities night after night. And final victory left the RAF facing its greatest controversy. Throughout the bombing campaign, it dropped more than a million tons of bombs on Germany. But the firestorms created by the carpet bombing of cities like Hamburg and Cologne killed thousands of civilians. Even Churchill described the bombing of Dresden in February 1945 as a step too far. Questions about the morality of bombing whole cities still echo today and have overshadowed the sacrifice of the bomber crews. It took 75 years for the bomber boys to receive a memorial. But for many, the RAF made an extraordinary contribution to victory over the enemy. Historian Patrick Bishop has been weighing up its achievements. I think it's fair to say that the RAF was the preeminent of the three services during the Second World War. Uh, it saved Britain in 1940. It took the war to the Germans when we had no other means of doing it. And you can see that in the respect it's held in by our allies, particularly by the Americans. They're the people you really had to impress. And they were more impressed by the RAF than they were by the Army and the Navy. And they made the best use of technology. They were modern-minded. They were forward-looking, the ethos of the thing was meritocratic and egalitarian. Uh, so it was very much a reflection of Britain as it was going to be, or how it wanted to be, rather than Britain as it had been. So I, I think that the RAF and its achievements during the war did quite a lot to shape uh, the attitudes and indeed the politics of post-war Britain. Post-war peace meant facing an unfamiliar world and unfamiliar roles. In 1948, the RAF took on a massive and unexpected mission that arose from the new world order, the Cold War. After the war, the four victorious powers divided up Germany and its former capital, Berlin. With the Russians determined to dominate Eastern Europe, Berlin found itself surrounded by hostile Soviet-controlled territory. In 1948, the Russians cut off all land access to Berlin. The only option left was to fly in supplies along three air corridors. As the red noose is drawn closer about the western sector of the capital, switches are pulled on generators, and the fuel famine forces drastic power cuts. Berlin becomes a city of darkness, This is the Dakota, one of the workhorses of the airlift. Two million West Berliners had to be kept alive. Supplies ranging from powdered milk to coal had to be flown in. At the height of the mission, planes were landing every 90 seconds. To get a sense of what RAF ground crews were up against, 
We're going to unload a Dakota. So we're going to have three and a half tonnes of, um, of supplies that we're going to have to move. Three and a half tonnes. Three and a half tonnes in ten, ten minutes. minutes. All right, All right, cool. So we're yeah. up for it? Yeah. Excellent. Let's Good. go. Back on. Good luck, yeah. I'll get around. Over the 12 months of the airlift, the RAF delivered a total of 394,000 tonnes of cargo in 66,000 sorties. That's us. Jeff Smith worked at Gatow Airfield during the airlift. It backed onto a Russian base, and they weren't overly friendly. You used to come on the uh, airfield at night initially and start putting rocks on the runway and things really? like that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. They used to try and flash searchlights in the pilot's eyes as they really? were coming in, yeah. All, all sorts of tricks like that. Yeah. I'll get the next one. Ten minutes to empty a full Dakota shouldn't be too tricky for Ewan. He used to have a proper job in a potato packing shed. It's good, there's lots more, isn't there? Oh, my God, there's ties all the way up. Left, so we were trying to do our exercise unloading the Dakota in ten minutes. Is yeah. that a sort of is that a sort of that was the sort of target that we aimed for? Yes. Right. Ten minutes to unload, and then we would backload if there was a load going back down into the British zone. And then you'd be straight onto the next aircraft after that. Would you? Well, there'd be a queue. A queue. There'd be a queue of aircraft. Are you proud of the part you played in? Uh, Absolutely. In the uh, we, we've always considered that we did help. A lot of people, people who were in desperate need as well. Oh shit! <laughs> okay, that's gone everywhere. Well done. Okay, that's it. Oh yes, nine minutes. <laughs> Woo! I had nine minutes on my watch. I don't know what the official timekeepers say, but I had nine. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Absolutely dripping. I tell you Sorry what, because you stooped over, everything's right in the small of your back. I did. I lifted all of those bags badly, you know. Should have gone back to your uh, your days in the tatty shed. I know. Up in Keeler. I know, but we had a we had a hydraulic lift that put them on your shoulder. I think it's just because everything's like that, so yeah, all yeah. the weight's there. Oh, that's really sore. We've got they another aircraft coming nice. in in a minute, though. That's the other thing. Yeah. Look at all the spuds under the plane. That's really <laughs> funny. Spuds everywhere. The Cold War was made all the more chilling by the advent of the atomic bomb. By 1949, both the US and Russia possessed weaponry capable of wiping humanity from the planet. When the RAF tested hydrogen bombs on Christmas Island in 1956, it announced Britain's membership of the nuclear club. Like a man-made sun, the fireball glows high above the Pacific Ocean. The RAF was now primed to drop nuclear weapons on the Eastern Bloc, a role that continued until the 1980s. This is the Avro Vulcan, made by the same company that built the Lancaster. It entered service just 14 years after its iconic predecessor and became the linchpin of Britain's nuclear bomber force. I'm really excited to meet two veteran Vulcan pilots, Johnny Ty and Martin Withers. Johnny joined in 1962 and Martin in 1971. The Vulcan was a bomber, but had something of the Spitfire about it. It certainly could outmaneuver any fighter of its era. You know, and the early missiles, you know, heat-seeking missiles, you'd, all they had to do was slow down and turn, and it would lose its... Well, it's, it really was superb. So, yeah, and it's a joy to fly. The Vulcan was armed with a nuclear missile, 60 times more powerful than the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. It was called Blue Steel. 
it were not pleasant times then. Mm. Yeah. And the blue steel was a pretty nasty bit of kit, wasn't it? Too? Oh, it was a horrid Sitting thing. on top of. Yeah. 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 The Terrans relied on letting the Russians know that if they launched a nuclear strike, the RAF was immediately ready to hit back. We'd go from 15 minute readiness to five minutes readiness, and then on occasions we'd go to three minutes readiness and we'd start the engines and actually taxi these things. And at the middle of the night uh, in the winter, when we taxied them, you know, you began to wonder whether it was for real or whether it was an exercise. All right, so you, were no, you didn't know it was going to be an exercise. You were well, scrambled, in effect. That, they were the nervous times when they, you actually fired the uh, old bomber up and, yeah. uh, and taxied it. Yeah. Each crew had two secret targets, usually airfields and towns within the Soviet bloc. I did meet a girl from one of those towns on holiday, and uh, that did shake me. Really? Really? Yeah, it really shook me. Mm. That I couldn't continue to talk to her. Wow. Were you fully expecting it to be a, a one-way mission? Well, I think we knew that. We hadn't the fuel to get back. Uh, we had a, um, alternate airfields proposed in Norway, but uh, they probably wouldn't have been there. And, uh, but it was just one of those things, you had to accept it. Yeah. But we all knew there'd be nothing to come back to. We never wanted it to happen, obviously, but um, there was no doubt that we would have carried out this mission in the knowledge that there was going to be nothing to come home to. I, I always felt that uh, the UK would never go to war on its own without... without uh, it would only be uh, a retaliation, if you like. Uh, so I, I, uh, I had to put that in my mind and, 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 and just think that way. Mm. And that way I was able to cope with the stress. Yeah, yeah. It was a grim business. Pilots were issued with an eye patch, so even though they might be blinded by the nuclear flash, they would still have one good eye. The moment when the Cold War got closest to boiling over was the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. The US demanded that Russia remove newly installed nuclear missiles from Cuba. The Soviets refused. When the crisis reached its peak on the 27th of October, the threat of nuclear Armageddon put the bombers on a three-minute warning. I think there was something like 160 warheads at that sort of time in the early 60s. Yeah. So there could have been a, you know, 160 uh, v bombers, Victors and Vulcans, taking off, carrying this uh, huge uh, hydrogen bomb. Wow. Yeah, they were ready to go. Both sides eventually backed down from the nuclear endgame. For the V Force pilots, it justified nuclear deterrence. It was very important. Uh, certainly, I'm proud to have been part of that even though I might not have been terribly keen on it at the time. But in retrospect, I'm extremely proud of, of what the aircraft and what the RAF did to keep the country safe. Throughout its history, the RAF has adapted to changing roles and technologies. Today, the Chinook helicopter is its most versatile workhorse, ferrying troops and heavy loads, of course, but also dropping special forces behind enemy lines. I'm going on a training flight with squadron leader Ian McFarlane, the most decorated of all post-war RAF pilots. What is it I actually like to fly? It's like a sports car. It, it looks big and cumbersome, but actually it is like a sports car. So Ian, we're dropping into low level now. This is a skill you guys obviously had to Right, the law is your, your bread and butter, wasn't it? This was where we felt safest. We regularly would train down to 50 feet, and, uh, and that's what kept us safe throughout a number of campaigns, really. Ian undertook special operations in the Gulf War and Afghanistan. But perhaps his most dangerous mission was in Sierra Leone in West Africa. In 2000, special forces were tasked with rescuing six British soldiers held by a rebel group, the Westside Boys. 
the RAF was called in to help. Surprise was essential, as the rebels had threatened to kill the hostages if they heard approaching helicopters. The preferred option was a silent approach by the SAS on foot, and the most definite bottom of the pile was a, an all-out helicopter assault to the front door of the, uh, the enemy. Yeah. Uh, but because of the terrain involved and the difficulties that the reconnaissance patrols had getting into position, that's exactly how it turned out. We expected to lose my aircraft, uh, and that went to ministerial level for, for permission to mount the assault based on that assumption. Uh, and I selected my crew based on um, people that were not married or didn't have any children, with the exception of myself. Well, that's some decision to make, yeah. The Chinook's 100 mile an hour downdraft is normally seen as a disadvantage, but not in this operation. We decided to use downdraft as a weapon. Um, I sat in as steady a hover as I could manage under the circumstances and watched the roof of the building peel off from front to back. And that was due to your downwash that you exactly, planned? Exactly, exactly that. And uh, watched one chap get out of bed, pick up his AK-47 assault rifle, run out into the corridor, run down the corridor, run out of his front door and raise the weapon, point it straight at me. Uh, and at that point, the decision to remove the windows in the side of the aircraft was vindicated because a small hole appeared in the middle of his forehead and he went down like a sack wow. of potatoes. And so he was shot from the Chinook itself? Yeah. Before the guys had a chance? Wow, that's amazing. Ian had a lucky escape, but one SAS soldier lost his life. And within 19 seconds of the first troop hitting the ground, all but one of the hostages were safe. 19 seconds? Yeah, That's so they, they didn't waste any time. Wow. The Chinook has already been in service with the RAF for 50 years, and will probably serve another 50. If ever you have to go to war on a flying machine, this is the flying machine that I'd want to go to war in. Yeah. It's just so capable and looks after its crew so well. It's the morning I've been waiting for. Today is my typhoon flight and I'm incredibly nervous. Having breakfast at Colin's house with our mum and dad, I can't help but feel disappointed Colin's not coming too. Well, I haven't. I, I'm not. I won't be flying with Colin, so that's a shame. But um, the other two were. <laughs> <laughs> he made me barf on both of them. <laughs> Ewan thinks he's leaving me behind, but I've got a surprise for him. So we'll see what happens. And uh, sort of talking myself into it almost. No, but, um, you'll be fine. The truth is, it's the most extraordinary opportunity. To of do course, it. yeah, quite amazing. Oh, oh! <laughs> what are you up to? Mm. We know you said it was a bit of a shame that we weren't going to be flying together in this programme. Yeah. Well, we are, because I'm going to be up in the in another typhoon next year. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to be up as well? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> With two such different professions, and you're both top of each profession, I think, to be able to work together, to me, is amazing. You are obviously going to be that. <laughs> That's your call sign today. <laughs> Oh, right. that's very funny. And I'm going to be a wingman. <laughs> <laughs> like any other RAF mission, the next step is the briefing. Collins' pilot, Wing Commander Chris Hoyle of one squadron, takes us through the sortie. Are some of the quick reaction alert. His squadron is about to be deployed in the Middle East. I want to give you a sense of the performance of Typhoon, because that's a bedrock of its capability. On most sorties, we would look, where possible, to use a tanker just to extend uh, our ability to train. We've got a My pilot is Group Captain Paul Godfrey, the station commander. Even the boss needs to keep up his flying hours. We'll refuel, simulate a dogfight, and experience some pretty uncomfortable G-forces. It's not a particularly pleasant environment often, uh, and it's quite claustrophobic. Then it's time to put on our survival equipment. The most important part are the high-tech suits that combat the dreaded G-forces. So now what I'm doing is I'm putting a, a set of uh, g trousers on, and they'll be connected to the aircraft. Air supply, 
And whenever we pull an EG, they'll inflate around all my ma major muscle groups and force the blood up into my head. Yeah, cash are fine. Yeah. Without the high-tech suits, our brains would be starved of oxygen and we'd pass out. <laughs> Relationship mum. Yeah. And then there's just two signatures. So the first one is, uh, you've already had your medical anyway, but you haven't got a cold. And that, I can hear that, so if you sign there. And then... I'm not sure who's more nervous, me or my mum. Thank you very much. Right, we won't prolong the pain anymore. Yeah, let's do it. Right. How are you feeling, you? Good. Yeah, I'm, excited. I'm sort of excited about it. I'm glad it's like we're doing it now and, you know, we're almost about to get going, which is good. The hanging around is less comfortable than the just about to do it bit. Ready? Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying goodbye. It is my day job. Yeah. Although I train a lot of Typhoon pilots in the simulator, this amazing plane was introduced after I left the RAF. So I've never flown in one. I can't wait to get up there. Ready in the back, Tom? Yeah, I'm ready, please, please. There we go. I'm first to experience the Typhoon's near vertical takeoff. Ten seconds. It looks like such a steep climb. Even on takeoff, the G-forces are immense. Uh, Let's hope my trousers work. Three green, head up, head down, 135. The reality is astonishing, like nothing I've ever felt before. It's so smooth. <laughs> And before we know it, we've broken the sound barrier. We're traveling at a thousand miles an hour, and it feels like I'm in a bubble. Our first rendezvous is with a tanker over the North Sea. At 20,000 feet, we have to connect with the tanker to refuel at a speed of 500 miles an hour. For Typhoon pilots, this has to become second nature. First up is Colin's plane. Once we've attached ourselves to the fuel hose, taking on 1,200 litres of fuel a minute, it's Ewan's turn. The Typhoon has a maximum range of 3,300 miles. But with refueling, that can be extended. And now the moment I've been waiting for. I'm handed the controls of a military jet for the first time since I left the RAF ten years ago. The planes I flew were from a completely different generation. They did the job, 
but they were heavy and cumbersome. This is just so light and agile. Then it's my turn to take over the controls of this awesome cutting edge airplane. So you have control. Okay. Just confirm you've got control, Ewan. I do have control. Excellent. Right. Control. I know 200 computers and Paul can take over at any moment, but this is astonishing. And what I can't believe is it's all happening at supersonic speed. So can I tell my mates I flew a typhoon then? <laughs> now we're ready to practice air-to-air -air combat. These days, the enemy is usually over the horizon. But the RAF still has to train for close-up dogfights. Who'd have thought it? My brother and I taking each other on at 20,000 feet. Oh, there you go. Oh, up. Right. The technology may have changed, but the techniques would be familiar to Mick Manick in World War I and Jeffrey Wellham in World War II. That was pretty good. Something, something. The last time an RAF pilot took part in a dogfight was during the Falklands conflict. In 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, a British territory in the South Atlantic. The British sent a force to recapture the islands. And when the troops from the task force landed to reclaim the territory, they found themselves under attack from the Argentinian Air Force. RAF pilot David Morgan was patrolling in a sea harrier when he saw Skyhawks attacking a landing craft. I saw the first Skyhawk hit the back of the landing craft with, with a bomb, um, a large explosion, and I knew that some, some of the guys there had died, mm. and that made me more angry than I've ever been in my life. Um, and I decided at that stage that guy was going to die. Uh, I wasn't shooting down aeroplanes. You know, people say it's just shooting down bits of metal. It wasn't on this occasion. I was going to kill the guy in the cockpit. As I was converting onto him, out of the corner of my eye, I saw another aircraft to the south of me by a couple hundred yards. So I locked my missile onto him and fired it right in at minimum range, three, 300, 400 yards, with a lot of overtake. And the missile came off the port wing and went straight up his jet pipe. I can remember seeing it actually disappear up the jet pipe before the thing vaporised, the whole aircraft just vaporised. David's speed of 700 miles an hour and the force of the missile flipped his Harrier on its back at 50 feet above the ground. Wrenched the aircraft back up again and found myself pointing at the, the guy I'd seen actually hit the landing craft. Locked the second sidewinder onto him. Um, the missile came off the starboard wing, took a big lead to the left across my nose and took him out at 90 degrees, went bang just behind the cockpit, and the whole of the back end of the aircraft disappeared, uh, just left the, the cockpit and about two foot of wing stub, I suppose, and that was it. When all of a sudden the parachute opened right in front of my face, and uh, it was the second guy who'd actually managed to eject right. um, before the cockpit hit the water. Oh. And I went underneath him so close that I actually instinctively ducked. Um, and my hatred then flipped completely to, this is another pilot, yeah. um, huge empathy with him, and then flipped right back again to engaging the next guy with guns. When he returned to his aircraft carrier, David wrote out a poem by a pilot from the Second World War. 
did Michelangelo aspire, painting the laughing cumulus to ride the majesty of air? He was a trier, I'll give this Jerry that. I let him have a sharp four-second squirt, closing to 50 yards. He went on fire, your deadly petals painted. You exist, a simple stature, man high without pride. You pick your way through the heaven and the dirt. He burnt out in the air, that's how the poor sod died. I thought that was particularly apt. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it screwed me up for a long time. Uh, I had classic symptoms of PTSD, and I, I can, I'm sure I can pin it down to those couple of minutes of incredibly, uh, incredibly intense emotions switching 180 degrees two or three times. David's story has so many echoes of the dogfights of World War I and II, the immense bravery and the terrible personal cost. Uh, yeah, we'll probably get out to the west coast, then pull up, do some of that GH. Okay. Wow. Bonnie Scotland. Bonnie on the way back, we're going on a high-speed trip down memory lane through the Highlands. My parents used to live in Alapur. Colin was conceived in Alapur. Oh my good god. Yeah. A bit too much information. <laughs> Flying in the typhoon has been such a privilege. It's brought together all we've learnt about the RAF. That was astonishing. That was just really, really beautiful. The typhoon and its pilots feel like worthy successors to the Spitfire the Lancaster and their crews. <laughs> the Royal Air Force has always been at the cutting edge of technology and innovation, but you've always got to come back to the people, because that's what the RAF's all about, really. It's about the people. And you find a commonality between all of them that, that, that ties everybody together, you know, and it's that, that ethos and spirit of the RAF that lasted throughout its 100-year history, and, and everybody's got a chunk of that in them that served. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> a couple of weeks have been, yeah, a real journey of understanding about this incredible organisation, starting at the very beginning with those amazingly beautiful and iconic paper aeroplanes they look like, don't they? Little rickety little machines, right through to flying the typhoon and meeting all the people we've met along the way who've been involved in this in this Royal Air Force. This is a special organization and, um, you know, ultimately saved our lives from invasion in the Second World War and still protect us to this day.